Thank you. And that concludes general questions. We'll move on now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister agree that MESH has become in Scotland and beyond the greatest medical scandal of modern times? First Minister. Uh, in general terms, yes, I would share uh, the concern that Jackson Carlow has articulated today and indeed has articulated uh, in, on previous occasions. Uh, for the Scottish Government, there are two uh, ongoing priorities here, and I hope they have the support of people across the Chamber. First was, of course, to ensure a halt to new mess procedures. And earlier this week, we saw the statistics showing that there are, have been no such procedures in Scotland since the Health Secretary took the action to uh, draw a halt to them. Uh, the second priority, which is certainly ongoing, is to make sure that women who have uh, suffered complications from mesh procedures in the past get the care and treatment that they need and are entitled to. And this is something the Scottish Government takes extremely seriously and will continue to take the appropriate steps. Uh, lastly and, and finally, the wider issues around MESH, and this is uh, something we've discussed in the Chamber uh, previously in terms of the approval uh, of uh, the, the particular procedure and uh, what, what are used in, in those procedures is a matter governed uh, by the MHRA. That's not within the responsibilities of the Scottish Government, but we have with the support of members across the Chamber, including, I think, Jackson Carlow, uh, urged action at UK Government level. Jackson Carlow. Thank you. Uh, Presiding Officer, the First Minister is right. This issue has seen a heroic and successful effort by Scottish MESH survivors to secure a moratorium on this practice, and we were delighted at the action of the Cabinet Secretary and the fact that the statistics this week showed that there had been no further procedures. We had hoped that for those women in desperate need of MESH removal surgery, Scotland would welcome the pioneering American surgeon, Dr. Dionysius Veronicus, to undertake MESH removal, which will change hundreds of lives. Yet we now learn that Dr. Veronicus has called off, mostly it seems due to a co coordinated attempt to block him by powerful people within the NHS and the medical hierarchy. Presiding officer, my constituent Lorna Farrell raised thousands of pounds herself to travel to the United States to be operated on privately and have her mesh successfully removed by Dr. Veronicus there. Surely the first minister will agree that it's unacceptable of women having been harmed, however inadvertently, by our own Scottish NHS, have to raise thousands of pounds to then undergo a horrendous journey while enduring severe pain and difficulty to have that wrong righted privately in the United States. First Minister. Well, again, can I, can I say to Jackson Carlow that I have uh, enormous sympathy with uh, the sentiments that he expresses today on behalf of his constituent, but uh, those sentiments, of course, could be expressed on behalf of any woman who has suffered uh, complications and is suffering uh, from a MESH procedure. Let me ad address very directly the issue of uh, the uh, specialist from the United States, uh, Dr. Veronikis. Uh, the Scottish Government wants him to come here and that remains the case. Uh, for him to be able to treat patients here, however, certain general medical council requirements uh, have to be met. The, the Scottish Government has no discretion to waive those. Uh, one of those is the need for a contract of employment from the National Health Service. That necessitates clinicians from here going to see him in the United States. Uh, we had hoped that would happen in August due to clinical commitments here uh, by clinicians here that had to be postponed. Uh, clinicians from here will visit the United States in November next month uh, and remain willing uh, to meet with uh, Dr. Veronikis if he uh, agrees to reconsider his position. I uh, very respectfully uh, concede that that is entirely a matter for him. Jackson Carlow talked about efforts on, the beha on behalf of senior influential people. I am not aware of any such efforts, and let me be uh, very clear about that. And it would not be acceptable for anybody within the medical community here to be seeking to block that. And it is not my understanding that that is the case. Indeed, it was the chief medical officer here who personally invited Dr. Veronikis to come to Scotland. And as I uh, said at the outset of this answer, it remains our wish uh, that that can happen. Jackson Carlow. The clear suspicion of many is that there is a professional and institutional campaign to frustrate Dr. Veronikis's involvement. It's the view of many that establishment figures in the NHS are trying to protect their own backs. And I exclude any blame or suggestion of it from the Cabinet Secretary personally here. Last night, I contacted Dr. Whale Augur, the leading MESH expert here in Scotland and one of my constituents, 
This is what he had to say about Dr. Veronicus's visit. I can confirm that surgeons here felt deeply threatened by Dr. Veronicus's offer to visit Scotland. No doubt there is a professional conspiracy against his visit. The surgeons suggested another US surgeon instead, Harold Goldman, who is one of the most prominent proponents of continuing the use of mesh. In addition, he promotes partial rather than total mesh removal, the complete opposite of Dr. Veronicus. Inviting Dr. Goldman would undoubtedly support local surgeons here in their efforts to reintroduce mesh procedures into Scotland. First Minister, if this is true, it's an outrage. Will the First Minister now personally intervene? First Minister. I, I have already, as I think Jackson Callow and others would expect me to have done, have looked very closely at this. If there is the suspicion that Jackson Carlow has narrated here today, I'm not going to stand here and second guess that. If that is what people feel, that is a suspicion that requires to be addressed. What I'm saying uh, genuinely to Jackson Carlow is that I am not aware of evidence that backs that up. And if uh, there is evidence, I would certainly want to see that and be in a position uh, to take action around that. I have set out, and I've tried to do it uh, very clearly and very calmly, the requirements that are not set by the Scottish Government, they're set by the General Medical Council that require to be met before somebody from outside the UK can come and treat uh, and practice here in the UK. Uh, those uh, requirements to be met required clinicians from here to go to the States. It is regrettable that that visit planned for August had to be postponed, uh, but that visit will now take place. And if uh, Dr. Veronicus is prepared to, to reconsider his position, then that will be an opportunity for that requirement uh, to be fulfilled. Um, I want, I think everybody wants uh, patients to have the treatment that they need. Uh, and, and let me say this point very clearly as well. The treatment that, that is considered to be clinically right for them, but also treatment that they themselves have confidence in and can be assured about the efficacy of. Uh, and I am prepared as First Minister to consider all options to make sure that women get that treatment. Um, and we will continue to do that because I do not underestimate at all in any way, shape or form, the suffering, the stress, the pain and the anxiety that many women have suffered as a result of this. Jackson Carlin. I thank the First Minister for that. I can say the women have complete confidence in Dr. Auger. Uh, who is actually acting uh, within the Scottish Government's own review group. Uh, and they have complete confidence in Dr. Veronicus, particularly my constituent, who is a living example of the success of his mesh removal procedures. Her life is transformed, and it's hugely emotional to meet her and see that. My principal concern remains firmly for the women affected. Arguably, the moment for a public inquiry may, depending on events, be coming. However, during this decade-long scandal, many of the affected women feel they have been unable to meet and discuss their experience directly with the First Minister. They feel that the urgency of their situation now needs the direct support and engagement of the head of their government. So together with MSPs from across the chamber, will the First Minister agree today to meet the affected women directly in early course, listen to them, and give them the personal commitment, leadership, and attention of the First Minister to get their lives sorted. First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, I will. Uh, but I want to, in doing that, I, I want to also today make it very clear uh, to the women affected uh, that this does have my personal attention, it has the close personal attention uh, of the Health Secretary. Uh, I think that can be demonstrated in the actions that have been taken uh, and we will continue to demonstrate it in the actions that will be taken. Um, I understand, I obviously understand the, the, the deep emotion uh, that many feel about this, uh, obviously the women affected, but those who have uh, direct contact uh, with the women affected. And I understand the scepticism uh, and the concerns uh, about uh, the, the way in which elements within the medical community in Scotland uh, are, are perceived to be addressing this. Uh, and we must uh, tackle that and we must systematically uh, take action uh, to make sure that that is not the case. I, I want any patient who considers it best and where there is a, a clinical view that it is best for them to be treated by somebody like Dr. Veronica's for that to happen. Um, I, I 
obviously cannot uh, stipulate that he agrees to come here, but if he is willing uh, to reconsider his position, then the steps are in process to fulfil the requirements to allow that to happen. Beyond that, we will openly consider any other options to make sure that women get access to the care and treatment uh, that they need. And that is a, a commitment that the Health Secretary has previously given, I have previously given, but I have no hesitation in giving it again today. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, can I uh, remind the First Minister that these mesh, mesh injured women have suffered years of pain and injustice so that when she meets them, will she apologise to them? Sure. One woman who contacted us spoke of having six surgeries, including a hysterectomy. I quote her, the surgery was necessary to rid me of the daily pain. I now live with a prolapsed bladder, bowel and vaginal vault, she said. I need to take a cocktail of medication daily, 18 tablets. She contacted us this week because she was so deeply upset to learn that Dr. Veronicus is not coming to Scotland. She is concerned that without his treatment, she may lose her job. First Minister, what do you have to say to her? First Minister. Well, again, um, and I've said this in the Chamber previously, as First Minister, I uh, apologise to any patient who suffers on the National Health Service. I think that is uh, something that people have a right to expect. There is a, a long history in terms of mesh procedure. We have uh, rehearsed some of that uh, often in this Chamber before. Uh, some of it in terms of the, the approvals for the procedure and the equipment used is, is out with the responsibility of the government. And, and we have come together as a, a parliament to uh, demand action uh, where that action can be taken. But in terms of the treatment that is provided in the health service, uh, the actions that we have taken, uh, firstly on the moratorium to halt mesh procedures, in itself, I think, is an indication of how seriously uh, we treat this issue. And then secondly, on the issue of women who are suffering from complications, I have already, and in the interest of time, I won't run through all of the uh, requirements around uh, the, the doctor from the United States coming here, but let me stress again that it is my desire to enable him to come here to allow patients to have access uh, to his specialism here without having to travel. Uh, but beyond that, we remain open to any options uh, that are right for women, both clinically and in order to give women the peace of mind that they want. One of the things that uh, distresses me when I uh, read uh, all of the material and, and read the personal testimonies here is that uh, I am advised as First Minister that full mesh removal has been carried out on many patients in Scotland. Uh, but I, well, if Neil Finlay, if Neil Finlay can allow me, I'm about, I'm about to address the very point that I think he's making to me. I also understand uh, that many uh, women believe that while they were told they were to receive full removal, uh, in fact, that wasn't undertaken. There are real issues that we do have to get to the heart of here, and I'm determined to do it. Uh, the Health Secretary is determined to do it. Many members in this chamber have been incredibly constructive in the approach to this, and, and I hope that together, uh, taking the full responsibility of government as it is uh, incumbent on me to do, uh, then we can uh, make sure that some of the historic issues uh, are fully looked into, but in the here and now, women who are suffering get access to the treatment that they need. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And there was indeed cross-party support for the moratorium, and this week's figures uh, are welcome. Uh, the First Minister spoke earlier of uh, looking for evidence of obstruction. Uh, in a letter to Labour's Neil Findlay, Dr Veronicus has written to explain uh, just why he has rescinded his offer. And he cites delays and disrespectful behaviours. Uh, but he also said this, and this is serious, and reflects something which the First Minister has just alluded to. He said uh, in his letter to us, and I quote him, the Scottish mesh injured women are vindicated in what they presented to Minister Freeman in March 2019. What has been recorded in their medical records as a full removal was not. It was a partial removal. First Minister, why have these women been misled and what are you going to do about it? First Minister. Well, I... I, I, I 
very openly alluded to that point. That is a point that concerns me deeply and a point that we are determined to help women get to the bottom of. I, I understand, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong about this, that the cross-party uh, group last night on chronic pain, there was an issue raised there about access to scans uh, for women who feel that they haven't had the full mesh removal that they were told they had. Again, that's one of the things that we want to fully uh, consider. We are determined to make sure that as far as we can, we get to the bottom of where women have been given treatment that has damaged them or where uh, treatment that was meant to rectify that has not been what they were told and, and where they get access to the treatment they need now. Uh, I've set out very clearly and very openly some of the issues. I regret the delays around uh, yeah. trying to, to meet the requirements to have Dr Veronica's come here, but those are requirements that the Scottish Government weren't able simply to waive, the requirements of the General Medical Council. Uh, but it is the case that there will be clinicians from Scotland visiting the United States next month. Uh, if the doctor uh, is willing to reconsider his position it's entirely a matter for him but I would I would very much welcome it if he did then those requirements can be met and I would still hope that Dr Veronica's can come to Scotland in terms of a letter uh, Dr Veronica's has also written uh, to the health secretary if there's information in uh, the letter Richard Leonard has uh, alluded to that we don't have I would be very happy to look at that if he wants to pass it to us if he hasn't already done so I can't stress enough the determination uh, on my part, on Jean Freeman's part, on the, the part of the uh, entire Scottish Government, uh, not just to get to the bottom of why women uh, are in this position, but to make sure we are giving women access to the treatment uh, that will bring an end to the pain and suffering that they are so unjustly experiencing. Richard Leonard. This is just so important. Dr Veronicus offered these women the first glimpse of hope that they might get their lives back. And the fact is, First Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Health looked Scotland's mesh injured women in the eye and she gave them a commitment to a course of action that could give some of these women their lives back. The world leading pioneering surgeon who the Health Secretary invited to come here now feels that the officials and senior surgeons in Scotland working for our NHS accountable to your government obstructed this course of action. And at the centre of all this, our women left languishing in pain. So your government has lost the confidence of these mesh injured women. Your health secretary appears to have lost control of this situation. So will you now step in and take the decisive action that is needed? First Minister. Um, I, I am already closely uh, involved in making sure that, uh, as the Health Secretary is, we are taking the action uh, that we require to take. Um, I, I would say it's, it's because of the action of Jean Freeman that the moratorium, the halt, uh, was put in place uh, and, and that there are no more of these procedures taking place. It is not uh, because of Jean Freeman that Dr Veronicus is not coming uh, at this uh, moment in time to Scotland. Uh, I have set out uh, the requirements that have to be met uh, and that they're not uh, Scottish Government requirements and how we are trying uh, to meet them. I'm more than happy to speak to the doctor personally. Uh, I, I am not aware, and I, I say this openly, because if, if anybody has evidence of the kind of obstruction uh, that is being talked about here now, then I want to know about that. But based on the information I have, uh, the attempts to get the doctor here uh, have been made and will continue to be made if, if he remains willing. Uh, so I can't be any clearer than that uh, than I have already been. There is an absolute determination uh, to make sure that we take the necessary action here. And I hope we continue uh, to have the constructive support of members across the chamber, including Jackson Carlow and Richard Leonard that we've had uh, in the past, because this is it's not a matter of, of party politics. This is a matter of doing the right thing. And we are all determined to do that. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to some constituency supplementaries. The first from Edward Mountain to be followed by John Mason. Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the new Highland Prison has been delayed for years and the current prison is no longer fit for purpose. It's overcrowded. 200 prisons, prisoners from the Highlands and Islands have been dispersed elsewhere. Seizures of drugs, weapons and mobile phones have increased. And we learned today from the Press and Journal's work that key areas of the prison are without CCTV, endangering prison staff. First Minister, is it not time that the safety and welfare of our Highland prison staff was made a top priority? 
And will you or your Cabinet Secretary meet jointly with me and prison staff to try and resolve the safety issues at HMP Inverness? First Minister. Well, the Justice Secretary, of course, would be happy to meet with members to discuss issues uh, in our prisons. Um, we are committed to uh, ongoing investment in our prison estate. Uh, we are committed to modernising and improving that prison estate. Of course, uh, security, not just in terms of prisoners, but security for staff who work in our prisons uh, is extremely important. Uh, CCTV is important. The SPS have other security uh, measures beyond CCTV for staff and people in their care uh, within uh, HMP uh, Inverness uh, in particular. Um, so we will continue to do that and we are happy to, to discuss these plans in more detail. But we will also continue to take action uh, to reform our justice system, uh, to, to tackle the fact uh, that while we have crime that is uh, amongst the lowest levels we've seen for 40 years or more, we have uh, proportionately the highest prison population uh, in the Western world. That's why we are taking action uh, to have the presumption against short-term sentences, to have more alternatives to custody, uh, which are better for rehabilitation and reducing reoffending as well. And I would say to the member, uh, to the best of my memory, the Conservatives have opposed every single one of those reform proposals. So this is a serious issue. Uh, and perhaps if the Conservatives were to engage with it a bit more seriously, constructively uh, in the round, we might make more progress uh, than uh, the progress that we're making to date. John Mason to be followed by James Kelly. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I think the First Minister will be aware that Glasgow City Council has expressed concern about the level of gambling adverts, especially that young people are exposed to. And I wonder if she has or she can have discussions with the Council about that. Well, this obviously is an important issue. I am aware of recent discussions within Glasgow City Council about problem gambling within the city and the impact that advertising is having on that. I understand that the Council is planning to hold a summit to develop plans to ensure that people are aware of the risks and harms associated with gambling. Uh, while advertising is the responsibility of the UK-wide Advertising Standards Authority, we're committed to exploring what more we can do to help deal with the problem uh, of gambling. Of course, it would be more effective if all powers associated with gambling were devolved to this Parliament so that Scottish solutions could be taken forward more quickly. James Kelly to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Colin McConnell, told the Justice Committee that a replacement for Berlini Prison in Glasgow uh, would not be operational until 2025, six years later than planned. Uh, Audit Scotland has deemed that the building is high risk and indeed 50, it's 50% 50 over capacity with many prisoners having to share cells and those of those shared cells, 92% were designed for single occupancy. The Chief Executive also stated that current contingency plans, if there was an emergency, simply involved moving prisoners to another location with mattresses and a floor. This is an unacceptable and unsustainable situation. So can I ask the First Minister what steps the government will take to address the chronic position at Berlini Prison and what plans they will put in place to address the crisis in the Scottish Prison Service around overcrowding, underfinancing and staffing? First Minister. Well, these are uh, serious issues uh, which uh, the government, uh, indeed at Cabinet level, uh, pay very close and very regular attention to. A replacement for Berlini Prison is, of course, one of our key infrastructure priorities. Uh, the SPS is progressing with plans for the development of uh, the new prison uh, in Glasgow and negotiations for purchase of a site that has been identified uh, are underway. Uh, however, we also acknowledge that as a result of the recent rise in the prison population, uh, interim measures are needed to improve current conditions at Berlini and uh, action will be taken in that regard. We're also closely working with the prison service to ensure that robust measures are in place uh, to ensure the safety of both staff and prisoners uh, who are in the care of Berlini. I think it is worth pointing out, in, in addition to the point I made uh, to a previous question, um, about uh, investment in our prisons being very important, but we also have a challenge as a country, uh, I think, to rebalance our uh, justice policy so that we don't have uh, so many people going 
into our prisons when actually more effective sentences would be available uh, elsewhere. Uh, but it's also uh, worth pointing out that since 2007, uh, the Scottish Government has invested almost £600 million pounds in the prison estate, including uh, for three new prisons, Lomos, Adiwell and Grampian, and refurbishment of existing prisons at Pullman, Edinburgh, Glenoco, Shots and Perth. Um, and we will continue to make sure that those investments are made uh, so that we uh, are easing the pressure on the prison estate overall, uh, but certainly and in particular, including Berlini. Adam Tompkins. First Minister, the SNP's Lord Provost has ripped off the people of Glasgow. Isn't it time she went? First Minister. Well, Eva Bollander, uh, who I think is uh, an excellent Lord Provost for the City of Glasgow, it has, uh, I think, rightly and very frankly reflected on some of the expense claims she made, all of which I, I will say were within uh, the rules, but nevertheless reflected on those and decided herself that she should not have made certain claims. I, I think that is the right decision. Uh, beyond that, I think all of us as elected politicians have to be careful and considered about uh, our expense claims. But I don't think any of us want to have a situation uh, where it's only people who can take on uh, those roles, uh, particularly those like Lord Provis, that uh, require attendance at a lot of formal function, that it's only people who can afford uh, to equip themselves for that that can take on those roles. So I think the Lord Provost... The Lord Provost has uh, herself reflected, and I think she was absolutely right to do so. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. I hope the, uh, I hope the whole chamber will join me in expressing solidarity with the Kurdish people, betrayed and abandoned. Betrayed and abandoned by the US and now enduring an assault by Turkey, a NATO member. I hope the First Minister will join me in condemning those actions. Presiding officer, ministers have been aware for over a year that the US military is getting a seven-figure discount to refuel at Presswick, an airport owned by the Scottish Government on behalf of the public. This is a growing scandal. There's already a US Congress inquiry into this relationship. If the First Minister is against Scotland being used as a nuclear submarine base for the UK, why should we be any happier to be used as a cut-price petrol station for the US Air Force? First Minister. Well, the Transport Secretary, of course, um, outlined the position in terms of uh, Presswick uh, earlier this week in the Chamber in response to uh, a topical question. Uh, Presswick Airport is state-owned, uh, but it runs commercially completely independently of the Scottish Government. And that's not something that is just done for convenience. It is essential that there is that arm's length relationship in order that we uh, are compliant with state aid rules. If we were to interfere in the running of Presswick Airport, we would put in jeopardy uh, the future operation of the airport. And for those who want to see the airport continue, for those who want to see it have a future, uh, and for those who want to see the jobs uh, that are dependent on it continue, then I think that is the right and responsible thing to do. Um, in terms of uh, the, uh, Patrick Harvey's question about Syria, can I uh, say very clearly and very strongly uh, that I and the Scottish Government am deeply concerned and strongly opposed uh, to Turkey's unilateral military action in northern Syria? Uh, and also extremely concerned by Donald Trump's uh, decision to withdraw support and leave Kurdish allies to the mercy of whatever Turkey chooses to do. I think that is particularly reprehensible uh, given the sacrifices that Kurds have made in helping to defeat ISIS. So I hope there is a very strong response from the international community, uh, both against the action that Turkey has taken, and we have seen on previous occasions the consequences and the implications for Kurds of Turkish action uh, of this nature. So I hope there is a strong opposition to Turkey's action, but I also hope there is a strong international support for Kurds as well. Patrick Harvey. The, the First Minister is keen to tell us about the arm's length relationship with Presswick, but the, the Presswick governance structure clearly shows that two of the First Minister's officials sit on the board of the holding company, and that's supposed to provide a line of democratic accountability for the issue so that we're not reliant on investigative journalists uncovering the facts of what's going on, but the, the Scottish Government should be giving us updates. So can the First Minister update us now? 
Is there, in fact, any other business plan for Presswick other than providing a bargain service for Trump's military and booking them taxes to Turnbury? Will the Scottish Government and the First Minister stop ignoring the nature of this scandal, accept responsibility to ensure that our public assets are not being used to support the military operations of a dangerous far-right regime and end the relationship between Presswick and the US military? First Minister. Well, I've set out the uh, situation in terms of state aids requirements. If we want to ensure that Presswick Airport has a future, we have to comply uh, with those uh, requirements. In terms of uh, the sources of revenue for Presswick Airport, those are laid out in the accounts that Presswick Airport uh, publish. Uh, the last set of accounts cover the period to the end of March 2018, and they publish uh, those accounts on an annual uh, basis. Beyond that, in terms of the future for Presswick, as we have always said, we want to return at Presswick Airport to the private sector as soon as uh, we are able uh, to do so. The senior management team at the airport has continued to engage with potential buyers and investors uh, and we will continue to take the action uh, that we require to take to ensure that that airport has a future because uh, I think that's what's important for the economy uh, in that part of Ayrshire and I think that's what's important for the many jobs that depend on Presswick Airport having a future. Question number four, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. A year ago, the Scottish Government published its waiting times plan. It said that nothing that had happened before should count against its record now, and this Parliament swallowed that. Since then, accident and emergency targets have been missed every week. All summer, they were worse than last year. There are more young people waiting over a year for mental health treatment. We've seen the worst ever performance against the treatment time guarantee. And we learned this week of a patient waiting four years for dental surgery. This is causing people pain, it's causing people anxiety and suffering. Will the First Minister take this opportunity to, to apologise to them? First Minister. Well, our NHS is seeing and treating uh, more patients than ever before. If you take accident and emergency, for example, uh, this year over uh, one and a half million patients have been treated within the four-hour target, which is the highest in any year since 2012. We're seeing uh, more cancer patients treated within uh, the targets and of course our investment in uh, the waiting times improvement plan is helping to ensure that the investments are in the right places to see waiting times uh, continue to come down. Demand is rising in our NHS which is why we are building the capacity to meet that additional demand and while of course there remain challenges, big challenges for our National Health Service, not least at the front line in our accident and emergency uh, units. Uh, Scotland's core A&E services uh, performance uh, was 10.5 percentage points higher uh, than A&E units in England and 17.6 percentage points higher than in Wales. So there are big challenges for everybody's NHS, but I think the evidence suggests that this government is making the investments and taking the actions that are right for patients across the country. Alice Crowell Hamilton. I'm sure that the comparison with other nations is cold comfort to people waiting, and these people are still waiting. In fact, the one single cancer target the government was actually meeting before the recovery plan, it isn't meeting anymore. The reason these people aren't being seen is that there is nobody there to see them. In mental health, psychiatry vacancies hit crisis levels this week. And the workforce plan has been delayed yet again by this government. It's, over, it's nearly a year late. When will we see it? When will A&E targets start to be met? When will mental health targets start to be met? On World Mental Health Day, is the First Minister really going to tell these patients to sit back, shut up, and wait another year? First Minister. Uh, no, uh, I, I would never tell anybody uh, to do that. Um, I, should, I should, of course, welcome Alex Cole Hamilton to his place yeah. for uh, First Minister's questions, covering for Willie Rennie, uh, who's on holiday. Uh, but <laughs> can I say, in terms... Alec Cole Hamilton has mentioned a number of uh, services in the health service. He mentioned psychiatrist vacancies. Uh, can I point out to him that uh, the number of CAM psychiatrists, uh, since we put additional funding into place, has increased by 15%. 
Uh, our accident and emergency departments are performing better than any others in the UK and we're <coughs> investing to make sure that across our National Health Service we're building the capacity to meet the increased demand. Uh, cancer has been mentioned as well. We are seeing more cancer patients within the target times uh, than previously. So we will continue to make these investments so that we have a health service uh, that is delivering the excellent treatment for patients that the vast majority of patients across uh, the country uh, already consider that our National Health Service is delivering. There's not much time today, but I'll try to squeeze in a couple of uh, supplementary questions. Claire Adamson, to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this weekend I received a handwritten note to my home from a constituent, an elderly constituent deeply worried about the impact of Brexit on her health. I have kept her informed of the ministerial statement from Tuesday and hope she takes some comfort from the work that the Scottish Government is doing to mitigate any circumstances. However, is the First Minister aware of the comments of Dame Sally Davies, the outgoing Chief Medical Officer of England, who this morning said of medicine supply in the event of a no-deal breakfast, and I quote, there may be deaths, we can't guarantee there won't. First Minister. Uh, well, I have seen the comments that Dame Sally Davis uh, has made this morning. Uh, they are absolutely horrifying. I mean, she has said that lives are at risk and it can't be guaranteed that people won't die uh, because of potential medicine shortages uh, and the impact of a no-deal Brexit. And if nothing else that has been said over recent weeks and months about the consequences of a no-deal Brexit uh, has made any difference to the UK government, then I really hope uh, that these comments today will make that difference. Uh, Michael Gove, I know, is in Scotland for uh, meetings uh, later on today. And, and the question to him really has to be, do people have to die before this UK government comes to its senses and rules out a no-deal Brexit completely. It is absolutely unconscionable uh, that it is still being contemplated and that at times it appears to be the desired uh, policy uh, of the Prime Minister and others. And it is absolutely beyond belief, particularly in light of comments like this, that Jackson Carlow and the Scottish Conservatives seem quite happy to back Boris Johnson in taking the UK out of the EU with no deal. I don't think people in Scotland will readily forgive them for that. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On the 11th of September, the Justice Secretary tweeted that he would meet with Alicia McPhail's family to discuss their concerns about the justice system. As of yesterday, the family were very upset that they had had no contact, not even a phone call. Will the First Minister tell her Justice Secretary to get in touch with the family without further delay? First Minister. No, I, I'll continue to support my Justice Secretary in taking uh, the appropriate and, and sensitive and right action that he has taken. Just to uh, be clear, Presiding Officer, the Justice Secretary made a commitment that he would meet with Alicia McPhail's mum before he met with any other members of the family. Unfortunately, for entirely understandable reasons, uh, that meeting had to be postponed uh, by Alicia's mum. Uh, so the Justice Secretary will honour that commitment to meet with the, the little girl's mum. And when he has done so, he will, as he said he would, uh, meet with other members of the family. I really honestly don't think we should be trying to make uh, party political points out of such a tragic case. Question number five, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Commissioner. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Challenge Poverty Week. First Minister. Uh, well, I think Challenge Poverty Week is very important. It is a reminder that we must continue with the actions we are taking to tackle poverty. Our current actions uh, are supporting low-income households, including directed, uh, targeted support of £1.4 billion last year. In addition, we've delivered over 87,000 affordable homes since 2007. Our increase in early learning and childcare will be transformational in supporting parents. Uh, we're also investing in new parental employment support. And of course, through our new Scottish child payment, we will lift 30,000 children out of poverty. Of course, it's clear that the biggest danger to increasing poverty is the UK government's continued welfare cuts and the risk of a no-deal Brexit, which could in itself push 130,000 people in Scotland into poverty. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer? Parliament will be aware that last week the UN Special Rapporteur said that Scotland is on a very different trajectory than the rest of the UK. He also said that the spirit of the welfare state is alive and humming in Scotland, but is waning elsewhere. The introduction of the new Scottish child payment 
shows how this SNP Scottish Government is determined to do things differently in Scotland. The policy will be transformative. But can the First Minister tell the Chamber what impact the Scottish Government could make if it didn't have to spend millions mitigating the most harmful UK government policies, such as welfare cuts and a no-deal Brexit? First Minister. Well, right now, even before uh, we contemplate a no-deal Brexit, we are currently spending £100 million every year to protect people from uh, the UK government's welfare cuts. Um, the UN Special Rapporteur described that as an outrageous situation, and I thoroughly agree with that. These are funds I think all of us would rather be investing in our own policies to tackle poverty. Uh, we are taking bold and radical action. The new Scottish child payment was described by poverty campaigners as a game changer. And that's the kind of action we will continue uh, to take to make sure we're doing everything that we can to tackle poverty. But as the seemingly rapid acceleration towards a no deal uh, Brexit continues, uh, then that makes it all the more obvious that we need to get powers out of the hands of Boris Johnson and his ilk and into the hands of this parliament uh, so that we don't have to put up with Tory welfare cuts anymore because we can take the right decisions here in the first place to help lift people out of poverty and create a better, fairer country for everybody. Question number six, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presenting Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to address the reported staffing shortfalls in psychiatric services, particularly those for children. First Minister. Uh, we're investing £54 million in a package of support to improve access to mental health services for adults and children, uh, providing funding for additional staff and workforce development. Um, in 2018, we saw an improvement in recruitment to psychiatric specialities. Uh, there has also been an increase of 15% in the number of CAM psychiatrists since additional funding came into place in March 2016. Uh, we've also provided funding of over £12,000 to the Royal College of Psychiatrists for their Choose Psychiatry campaign to promote psychiatry as a career in Scotland. Brian Whittle. I thank the First Minister for that answer. And I was interested to uh, listen to your answers and your response to Alex Cole Hamilton's questions because I received correspondence from the Royal College of Psychiatrists stating that more than one in six consultant children and adolescent psychiatric, psychiatric posts are vacant. Sure. To compound this pressure in services, the report in CAMS, 40% of children and adolescent psychiatrists are anticipated to retire within five years. Of course, it takes six years training for a junior doctor to gain consultant status, and then they report a decrease in the numbers choosing to progress from core to higher psychiatric training. Um, so we have a growing demand, an already high vacancy rate, compounded by a large number of psychiatrists approaching retirement age. So, First Minister, when will the Scottish Government produce a realistic workforce plan that can meet these escalating challenges and ensure that our children receive the mental health care they deserve? First Minister. We are already uh, taking action and as I'm about to uh, set out, that action, while there is still work to do, is already having an effect. Uh, there are challenges in a number of medical specialties around recruitment. These are not unique to Scotland. Uh, they're experienced in other parts of the UK and indeed other parts of Europe and the world. Those challenges are not made easier uh, if we make it harder for people to come here as a result of Brexit or Tory crackdowns on immigration. And I think that's a point that we uh, should not uh, stop yeah. making. But in terms of psychiatry, uh, we have, as I said in my original answer, we've seen an increase in the number of CAMS psychiatrists since we made additional funding available in 2016. Uh, there remain unfilled consultant uh, psychiatrist vacancies in a number of health boards, but over the past five years, we've increased the number of psychiatric posts by 8.5%. Um, and in 2018, and this is important, we saw a significant improvement in recruitment to psychiatric specialties uh, with a, a higher fill rate of 72% compared to 55% in the year before that. So uh, these are important steps. There is still work to be done and we remain focused on ensuring the investment and the plans are in place uh, to, to do that work and make sure that we have the right uh, medical specialists in place where they're needed. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. There's no member's business today, so I'm going to suspend this meeting. We resume at 1.30. 1.30. Parliament is suspended. <laughs>